I gotta admit, I'm a little surprised that people are actually tuning in and watching this. The title's right there, guys. You can read it. It's on the screen, too. No excuses. And part of me wonders how many of you guys are watching this fun and wonder, did Tiger finally go off his rocker? I mean, every time I do videos like this, I have a couple of things that are going to be predictable. I can already tell you what's going to happen. A lot of people are going to say, where the hell do you come from? Why do you think you're the white knight? Why do you think you're the savior of paintball? Why do you think it's only you? You have all the answers. Well, I don't. I readily admit that I don't have all the answers. The problem is a lot of you guys think that by putting my opinions out there, I'm saying, oh, well, I'm the only one who knows. No, I don't know. Again, the whole purpose of doing things like this is to spark debate, get discussion going, get people talking about it. That way, we can come up with an answer. One person doesn't have all the answers, but you get enough people together, they just might. Now, a lot of people also, when they see these videos, they just get all uppity about, where does this guy even come from talking like this? He's not a, he's not a tournament guy. He doesn't know anything about tournaments. He doesn't play tournaments. Well, no, I don't and I don't believe I need to because I see paintball doing the same thing year after year after year and failing. It's a misattribution to Albert Einstein and seen a couple other people get quoted in the same thing to say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I've seen enough uh, misattributions to that but uh, paintball does this year after year after year we tr keep on trying to put the same thing out there and say see we're a cool sport and it doesn't work so the whole idea of this video is to explain why it doesn't work and I'm gonna warn you guys ahead of time now because I hate cliffhangers just as much as anybody else if you guys want an answer video as far as what I believe the sport could do to fix itself I will do that next time but right now I want to focus on why I believe the sport is broken. And let me state this outright as well. If you have a differing opinion, I encourage that. Make a video response. Even if it's just uh, you talking to the camera or if it's just you all doing audio. That's fine. Let's talk about this, guys. Let's, let's get some discussion going. Leave comments down below. Comment on forums. Let me know where you're going with it. I just want to see. Because, again, I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. But somewhere in the middle between all of us it's there. So let's talk about paintball as a sport, as a public sport. I've always said that paintball is to sport what disco is to music. It's where people pay money to entertain themselves. Okay, minus the cocaine. But that's what paintball is. You go there, you pay them 50, 100, how much ever you spend, you entertain yourself, you go home. That's it. It's not a sport. Even at the highest levels of competition, it's the same way. You pay your money for a weekend, you play your eight games, you feel good, you go. That's it. Now I'm going to start this discussion um, with something that's actually kind of petty. And I'll readily admit that, and that's a lot about clothing. Everything about paintball clothing has been borrowed from somewhere else. The only argument that I can think of is the pullover. And that's because the pullover really got popular in the early 90s because of a rush order what it comes down to and when the pullover hit popularity that's when a lot of other people kind of sat up and oh they, they like they don't want to wear BDU jackets they want to wear something that's gonna be you know bouncy okay well we can we can do that that brings me to the jerseys do you realize that most of the paintball jerseys are actually throwback motocross jerseys back in the early 90s right around the pullover craze um, JT USA made a really really heavy push to um, get their jerseys going. And that's mainly because JT was kind of not really a motocross powerhouse. If you wanted to talk motocross, you were talking Scott, you were talking a couple other companies, but JT, they'd been there since 1971, but they really didn't have that motocross presence. So they took a lot of their surplus motocross jerseys, and I'm, I'm going to put this out there, this is alleged. I've heard this from too many sources to not believe it. But the way I understand it is they took a bunch of their motocross jerseys, the neon pink and the electric blue jerseys, and then threw them at their pro teams and said, you guys wear these for a couple of tournaments, get your pictures taken, it'll be awesome. And that's when they started to sell. And I actually have a picture from 1993 from the JT catalog, and you look at the, uh, the jersey the guy's wearing, and you're just thinking, who would play paintball in that? 
even today, even with a bunch of the ag kitties, I think they'd even look at it and go, okay, that's kind of retro cool, but no. Neon pink slow. Anyway. So a lot of the motocross jerseys were repurposed for paintball, and we really haven't outgrown that necessarily. Another thing, um, all the jerseys are bounce engineered. This is another reason that paintball fails, is that part of the clothing is actually designed to work against the concept of the game. I understand, nobody likes to get shot out. It's more fun to stay in the game longer legally, but if you remove that aspect, if you even put a percentage in where, oh, the paintball might bounce, you're basically destroying a core component of the game through your clothing. Doesn't seem right to me. And also, I could talk a little bit about flashover substance here, too, as far as how it fails. Jerseys are meant to look good on the shelf, and they're meant to look really good in the staging area. But um, I was also thinking about this. When you look at other sports teams, you look at uh, hockey teams, you look at football teams, you look at um, soccer, or I guess football if you're in another country, you look at these teams. Their uniforms are simple and basic. It's a one or two color scheme. You've got the team logo on it. That's it. Paintball jerseys are all over the place. And the only other thing I can think of is motocross. Those guys have really flashy jerseys, but then again, they have to. You've got um, 16, 32 some odd people on the course at the same time. One of the only ways you can be readily identified is by having a bright colored jersey that nobody else has. Or having a team jersey that your own team guys can recognize their own guys coming towards them. We don't need the flash, but that's paintball for you. Let's talk about the pants. Again, motocross BMX pants. The original BMX pants um, from the 1990s and 80s or so, they were long pants and they had um, padding sewn into the knees and the shins. I actually still have a set of the motocross pants from JT. They don't fit me anymore. I kind of outgrew them. But um, it's, th it's there. It did. Now, some of it was also borrowed from inline roller hockey. Matter of fact, uh, one of the people that sponsored the Web Duck Show, Next, they were a roller hockey company. And I like playing in those pants. I actually have a set of, um, I forget the name of the, the uh, company offhand, but it's another roller hockey company. I love those pants. They're great. They're lightweight. They, they're perfect. So that's why we borrowed them. And now, you basically got a restylization of the inline hockey pant, which has the padding on the knee and the shin. Again, back to the padding thing. Make the bounce happen. Make the player happier. Let's talk about shoes, too. This sounds really petty, but um, we used to wear football cleats. Now we're wearing golf spikes. I wish I was kidding. I was looking up paintball cleats the other day, and I ran into the, uh, what are they called, HK Shredders. They're golf shoes. They're in cooler colors, but they're golf shoes. Then I found the Exalt cleats. They even on their website have golf style spikes. They're golf cleats. I, I would have never thought it, although actually I can't really say that because way back in the 90s, in the mid to late 90s, I was actually wearing golf shoes to play on some of the arena fields because I was looking at the terrain going, you know, the soft spike golf shoes would work really well. Matter of fact, they're still right over there. And if you look at them, they don't look like golf shoes, but I got them from a company called Bite that was making shoes specifically so they did not look like golf shoes. But they're golf shoes. We're wearing golfing shoes. I just wonder how many uh, paintball players would go onto the golf course. I shouldn't go there. Nah. Let's talk about the goggles, because the goggles are pretty much the only thing that we can really call our own. Although, let's go back in time a little bit to the early 90s with JT Racing once again. JT Racing saw a big problem. Uh, that is that paintball goggles were insignificant. They, they, were, they, were, they were insufficient, more correctly. So they redid the goggle line and they came out with the JT Snapper and then eventually the JT Whipper Snapper. It's this small, tiny goggle, but when you look at it, it's their motocross goggle, essentially. The lens itself is different. Very, very different. But the frame design, it's the same thing. The mask that they gave with it was basically their motocross mask. Yes, they had masks in motocross. Matter of fact, the Woodstock masks that people were wearing before that. Motocross ATV. Somebody's going to correct me on this, but that's okay. 
I'm not afraid to be wrong on this. So we borrow, we rape and pillage club everything. That's actually kind of brings me to the format. Let's talk about Capture the Flag and why it fails in modern paintball, in the public paintball, I should say. we got to go back in time again. Let's talk about the 80s, 80s, 90s, which is just a wee bit before my time. Two Flag works in the woods. It's a great game to play in the woods. It works because there's an air of mystery. You've got guys in, con- you got guys in camo, using stealth, they know how to work concealment. It works. Everybody who's played a woods game has a story about themselves or a buddy of theirs grabbing the other team's flag without the other team knowing it. This works in a woods setting. That end, it's cheap. Um, cause it, again, we got to look back at the early 90s when setting up a field needed 20 rental units. It's not cheap. Even by today's standards, it's not cheap. But back then, it was even more expensive. So, you want to run games. You got to do a couple things to save a little bit of money. Okay, you go over to your local big box mart, pick up two bandanas. You got a game. Or heck, you lose a bandana, play center flag all day. Nobody cares. It'll be fun. Problem is that when you're playing in the woods, that takes time. A good woods game now is about 20 minutes long. Back in the day, a good woods game was 45 minutes long. Just saying. Well... Let's fast forward to about the 1990s. There was this revolution to get paintball on television. we got to put paintball on TV. This was the driving goal of the paintball industry. Put paintball on TV. Why? I think it had to do with money. The idea was that if we get paintball on TV, we'll attract the major sponsors, and the major sponsors will bring major cash. So we have to put paintball on television. And they tried to put the Woods game on TV. It didn't work that well. I loved it personally, but they had to groom the woods. They were cutting down trees, cutting down tree limbs, so the camera guys could get their angles. And this was just not going to work across the country. So what they did was they decided, okay, let's take the game out of the woods, put it into the arena. And I remember reading stories from 1989, 1990, the first couple of arena games. They would literally take over soccer, uh, indoor soccer fields, and they would play 15 on 15 in that set up barricades and all that. Uh, The one team that I remember, and if anybody can find these guys, good luck. Uh, They were a team on the East Coast called the Green Machine. And they were all wearing green sweatshirts and green sweatpants with Green Machine (sighs) heat transferred with those little fuzzy letters down the leg. Oh, how times have changed, right? But people wanted to get this game on television. So what they did was they took the same two-flag format that we all knew and put it into arena. Now, I remember playing the Knoxville Indoor, which took place in a rodeo arena. It was a five-on-five tournament in an entire rodeo arena. A lot of fun. I mean, that was actually a game because you had a lot of space. You had a lot of room to move. And there was still a little bit of an air of mystery because in some places you could not see from corner to corner of the fields. It was pretty awesome. So if anybody knows Randy Baxter, tell him I said thank you once again. We started to get this problem, though. Same game, new clothes, but biggest problem is by putting it in the arena, the game is pretty much all but over before the objective was completed. Games were taking five or ten minutes, and most of that was basically sitting back because that's what the format rewarded. If you look at the old All-Americans videos, they were masters at hanging back and waiting for the other team to come to them. You make the other team be aggressive, you make them make the mistakes. That was what was rewarded by p- taking the same game and putting it into a really wide, big arena. No incentive to do anything. So, the answer that they came up with was to shrink the arena down even further. Make it more exciting. Right off the break, both teams are in range, both, every, every player is in danger. You can lane off the break and eliminate half of the team in the first five seconds of the game. Then you reduce the number of bunkers out on the field. It gets people shot, but then you allow the amount of padding they can wear so that it's to protect the players. BS, it's to get bouncers. Just call it what it is. Then let's keep the firepower pretty high. We had firepower rates of 12 a second back in the early 90s, then it kicked up to 15, I think. It changes every year or two, so I haven't even kept track, but I I think it's stabilized to 12, 12 and a half again. Somewhere around there. 
that's a lot of firepower. And I understand firepower is cool in America because we love our guns and we love guns that shoot lots of lots of lead real lots of really quick. We like that. But we're playing the same format. We're playing the same woods format in this arena. The format has not evolved. The game has evolved, but the format has not. In the modern game, the flag is an afterthought. Without that component of the unknown, without the camouflage, without the concealment, without the stealth, the flag's significance minimal. The risk of flag capture is not worth the reward of points when everyone on the field can see your move. You can make it worth 65% of the po available points, won't matter. The only working strategy in the arena game now, eliminate the other team, go back for the flag. Now, to be fair, you go back to the early 90s and the Big Woods format, yeah, this was kind of the same thing, but you still could hide one guy out on the field. If he saw everything was going south, he could hole up someplace on the field and hold out and not max, not let the other team max. You can't do that in the arena now. It's obliterate the other team, go back for the flag, take your time. It doesn't work. When the game is technically over before you achieve the objective, it doesn't work. In fact, I would be willing to make a bet on this one. I'll bet you dollars to donuts that you could make the tournament format total elimination. No flag at all. The games would not be significantly different. Anybody want to take me up on this one? Anybody want to run a total elimination tournament? Be pretty awesome. Kind of related to the, uh, the media thing I was talking about. I think that paintball made an error, a tactical error, by trying to lump itself in with the extreme sports genre. Back in the 90s, extreme sports were kind of a buzzword because everybody's like, oh, extreme sports, this is going to be awesome. The birth of the X Games will get extreme. Now, when you look at extreme sports, though, it doesn't fit. Most recognized extreme sports are gravity sports, sports that require the seeming defiance of gravity, things like snowboarding, skateboarding, um, freestyle, BMX, freestyle BMX, freestyle motocross, all these things. Most extreme sports also involve the risk of bodily harm from doing the sport, not from other people doing stuff to you, from you trying to perform a trick. And that's actually the, another thing, is that most of these extreme sports are aesthetic. It involves going up into the air, doing some sort of a trick, coming back down unhurt in a way that seems almost unbelievable. And the other thing is that most of them are individual sports. I, I, I hate Wikipedia. I really hate Wikipedia, but it serves its purposes. And if you look up the extreme sports page on Wikipedia, paintball is listed as an extreme sport. But it is glaringly out of place. Blindingly, glaringly out of place, because every, almost every other sport here is an individual sport. Paintball is the only team sport on there. And the other thing is that it's a really safe individual, it's a really safe sport for individuals. We know this. It's one of the selling points that we tell people. What's it doing on this list? When you're looking at things like kite surfing, aggressive inline, what the heck is wheelie? Yeah, it's probably something that's really cool that I can't do. It doesn't fit. We don't fit. And we're also trying to sanitize the extreme experience, too. Since I'm on this extreme topic, in the 90s, there was a huge, huge move to sanitize the language. We were an extreme sport, but we were using markers and tagging people and gogging them. In the real world, we were using language like, you know, well, we've got guns and we're score racking up kills, and nobody wanted to hear that. We're still doing this. We're still... You go onto the forums and you still see people talking about markers. It's not a marker. Just call it a gun. It's not going to... You know, A lot of people are going to rag on me for that, but it's a gun. You know, it's like a staple gun, a glue gun, a confetti gun, a t-shirt gun. It launches a projectile. Call it what it is. Call it a paintball gun. Call it a paint gun. That's fine. I'm just saying... I, it just it just bugs me, and this is one of the things that I also think that fails is that the industry is saying one thing and the players are saying another, and we can't meet in the middle. And when we do, it's only for politically correct purposes. And as I said before, being politically correct means always having to say you're sorry. <sighs> 
Okay, shift gears, move on. Let's talk about some of the big show events in paintball. When you're talking tournaments, you're talking about NPPL, you're talking about um, all these big series. People do not come to these events to watch the events. Now, if you know somebody there, you'll come. If it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, I, I don't I don't make judgments. Uh, if it's one of your kids, you'll be there to watch. Cheer them on. But nobody, nobody goes to an event like this specifically with the idea of, hey, I'm going to sit here and watch the games. We don't do that. Tournaments are in the business of selling a sport experience to the players. Nothing more. Again, we go back to the opening line. Paintball is a version of disco. That's what we do. And then you can hear people saying, well, pain paintball's been on TV. We've been on TV. We've been on ESPN. We've been on OLN. We've been on ESPN2. We've been on all these networks. Do you guys realize those have been basically over-glorified infomercials? The tournament producer pays for those spots. Almost all of them. We're not ready for the big time. We get excited when we get a mention on things like Sports Center. We get excited to get these little morsels of exposure. After 20, 30 years, we're still excited for this little bit? That's, that's telling me we're not ready for the big time. The fact is that in order to make people come and watch the video, the, these, sh these things, these shindigs, we need to put it in their faces. It's no better than going through the mall and having somebody for the perfume counter jump in front of your face and spray that damn thing in your face. We do, get, we do events in like Huntington Beach, in Vegas, to some extent Skyball when they did it at the Sky Dome. We have to put the game into people's faces to make them watch. No guarantee they're going to sit by and just stay there. Yeah, you're going to attract some people who are going to like, oh, wow, this is kind of cool, this is kind of neat. But you're not going to obtain a long-term audience this way. It's not going to happen. Okay, so what's wrong with the format? This is kind of, I guess, what people have been waiting for, I guess. First of all, there's no focal point. Every other sport, you can watch the ball. You know what's happening. Okay, a couple of exceptions. Um, some people argue that auto racing is a sport, and yeah, you can just, but you can follow the pack. You can see what's going on in there. You can see who's trying to pass, who's trying to do what. In paintball, to use the sport thing, it's everyone has the ball, and seemingly nobody knows what to do with it. Everybody has the potential to make the action happen, but generally speaking, it looks like they don't. And as I said before, the flag is an afterthought. So the central focus of the game, the flag, doesn't even matter at all. Now to the average layperson, laning, and I can hear people rolling their eyes and starting to warm up the keyboards, but laning seems wasteful and unskilled. And I'm going to answer you guys in just a second on this one, but that's what it looks like. Most people, when they watch tournament paintball, they're saying, why is that guy wasting so much paint? What's he doing? Oh, he's laning. Oh, what's laning? Well, he's shooting a lot of paint to make sure that guy doesn't come out of his cover. Well, what's to stop the guy from coming out the other side of the cover? Well, that's the skill of laning. What? To the average person, that doesn't make sense. It's giving a golfer unlimited mulligans. Doesn't work. Now, as far as, let's see, movement. Kind of speaking of laning, movement. For the most part, there is no movement. There's no action. Players may bump from one bunker to the next. But short of your opening move and your closing move, nothing happens for seemingly minutes at a time. Sometimes. That's why the next time you're watching paintball videos on YouTube and you see a highlight reel, count how many times that they're showing you an opening move or a closing move as compared to showing you mid-game action because it doesn't exist. You might see a guy crawling the snake. You might see a guy vaulting over and then shooting somebody point blank in the snake. That's it. That's all the action there is. You can boil down most five-minute speedball games into a 10-second highlight reel. Maybe 15. Which actually brings me to something else. Games can last 15 seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, who knows? There is no way to guarantee that the action will last. Now for television, this is bad. For an audience, this is bad. Because by the time they start getting settled into what's happening, the game could be over. 
Or the game could just devolve into this, well, why are they just sitting there? Why don't they just make a move? Why can't they do this? Why can't they do that? And if your audience is questioning everything that the players are doing, they're going to lose interest and they're going to move on because they're not going to understand what's going on. They don't see the point. Understand that tournament paintball nowadays is designed to run bodies through. Now let's compare this to other team sports. Um, as far as the time thing, paintball is over than less than a half an inning of baseball. Sometimes even if it's over by the four, you get one down in football played. Tournament paintball is pretty much about the quantity of players, not the quality of players. Hence the whole idea of giving them unlimited resources, letting them shoot as much paint as they want, giving them high rates of firepower, giving them bounce jerseys with bounce vests. Let them play. Let the boys play. They paid their time. They paid for their time. They paid their money. Let them play. Now this is probably why the sport's never going to go legit, because it's not seen as profitable to exclude some people based on their skills. Which actually brings me to another reason what's wrong with the format. There is no exclusivity. If you got money, you can jump in. You know that's cool. You want to play on the national stage? Pay for it. Now I do know there's a ranking circuit. I do know there's there's ranks in there, and I know you have to earn your way. But from everything that I've seen. All you really have to do is show that you have the money and the staying power and peop and the willingness to go up there to, to play the higher ranks. You can play. And there's going to be tournament guys who are going to disagree with me on this, and fine, disagree all you want. But the fact is that I could get 10 people who have never played before, get them high-level guns, give them two months of training, and, I could give, and they could give you a run for your money. Because there's no exclusivity. I could enter a bunch of a bunch of rank rookies as a D as a D what D three D four team maybe D, D whatever no exclusivity. Now this also brings you to one other thing that I've been kind of avoiding and it's a snob effect. Oh, you don't understand. You don't play paintball. You don't play tournaments. You don't get it. You don't got you. Just, you you got to play to get it. Most baseball fans do not play baseball. Most football plans do not play fo football plans. Football fans, they don't play foot. They don't play football. A lot of golf fans, well, they play golf. But people who are fans of team sports, generally speaking, do not play the, those team sports. They might play on like a Sunday softball league. There's a kid they might have played Pop Warner football. They might have a passing interest in. Oh well, you know, yeah, we, we I do golf once in a while but you don't see it you don't see these people you know you don't see the football guys saying well if you don't play you don't understand the audience should not need to play to understand they should be able to have an understanding of what's going on and why players are doing what they're doing again the television effect the the sports bar effect I'm sorry it's when you in a crowded sports bar where you can't hear the TV can you follow the action if the answer is no you're not exactly a uh, team sport that can make it on television you failed. Sorry. Have a nice day. Now let's talk about fixing it. And for those of you looking at the little slider down there, you're saying, well, he's almost out of time. Yeah, because I don't want to go into that this episode. Uh, reason is, is that this could take another half hour or so. So I warned you ahead of time. But um, there will be. So I'm going to pick this one up next time if you guys are interested in that. But I'm going to close with one idea um, to kind of talk about fixing it. Let's talk about snowboarding. Snowboarding had been around in one way or another way, way back when. I mean, we can go back to the Snurfers. There's one to Google. But right around the 80s is when they really started to pick up steam. Um, where are they now? They're in the Olympics. And nobody has ever made a thread saying that snowboarding is dying. So what did they do right? Partially it has to do with timing because there was sort of a drop off in skiing and you had a bunch of kids who wanted to pick up something different. And then again, skiing also had that downhill freestyle ballet. Ugh, don't even want to talk about that. It was part luck because it was right place, right time. Part capitalization because they really captured the minds of a whole bunch of, ki of kids who were like, skiing, uh, no, let's go boarding instead. That seems cooler. But I also think it's because, as a sport, they realized they just could not do it for themselves anymore. Oh, sure, there's a huge rec market. 
I, for one, am one of them, because um, when I go snowboarding, I do not have any illusions of being one of the park rats. But it's still fun to do on your own. Fine. But when you start looking at the half-pipe competitions, you start looking at the park competitions, this is where you can realize that snowboarding realized, okay, this isn't about us anymore. It's about putting on a show. Paintball is still in that it's all about me feeling and attitude. Paintball players do not want to give that up for an audience. Ever. An audience of their peers? Possibly. But an audience of people who don't know what the heck's going on? No way. Ain't gonna happen. If paintball wants to go into the mainstream, making it for yourself is not gonna work anymore. And we'll leave it at that. If you like the show, comment down below. Let me know what you think. Um, if you want to share this on one of the Facebook groups, uh, check us out on Facebook. We are Web Dog Radio on Facebook. You can talk about it there. Once again, thank you guys very much for your time, and I will see you next time.